What happens when you throw your kitchen sink at the opponent? Well, today we're gonna find out. Now, before we do, make sure you hit that subscribe button. What is the kitchen sink middle game? Well, it might depend on what's in your kitchen sink. Uh, this reminds me, I probably should do the dishes. Yeah, they're kind of piling up. But the kitchen sink is when you throw everything at your opponent, and I do mean everything, we're gonna see it today. It doesn't always work, of course, but when it does, oh boy, is it fun. And who else? Can we show a dynamic attack than the modern day maestro of such kitchen sinks? That would be Grandmaster Alexei Shirov. Yeah, don't let him come in your kitchen because he's gonna break your sink. Now, the first thing he does is he gives away a rook. Now, let's try to remember everything he gives away. You might wanna bring a little tote bag to put all of the fallen warriors inside it. First thing, he gives away the rook for the bishop. So he sacrifices a rook, we'll just say that. Okay, after bishop takes, knight takes. Now he does get a center pawn for the rook, okay? It actually was a sound sacrifice. Actually, everything he does today is gonna to be sound. It's just gonna be amazing. Now, white decides he doesn't wanna let this knight stay there for too long. He doesn't wanna take time out either to save this pawn because then the knight might take the bishop and then black will get two very strong bishops. So, white gives away a pawn by playing knight f5. And what that does is, after bishop takes and queen takes, it gets rid of the strong knight. That way, white can preserve the bishop. Now, it does cost white oh. this pawn, but white's idea is to get the bishop to d4 later on and basically stop the power of this bishop. Two bishops are really powerful, but when you are reduced to only one lightsaber, the power goes down by, I would say, more than 50%. We'll have to ask the chess Jedi, James Canty, if my percentages are right. Okay, so white saves the rook. Rook on f to d1. Shirov gets his rook in the game. And now if you move the bishop, of course, you hang the e2 pawn. So there's no time to play bishop d4, at least not just yet. So white gets the other rook in the game. Totally logical. And black opens up the bishop and also hits this pawn. And white plays the very calm rook to d2, guarding this pawn, also guarding this pawn. And white would love one more move because if the bishop goes to the square d4, that totally puts the fire out. That's the baking soda on the grease fire. Wait a minute, do I have my science right? I don't know, I don't spend as much time in the kitchen as you might think, but black will not have nearly as much fun without the pair of bishops. So. We already sacrificed one rook. Let's sacrifice another. Oh, no. That's right. Both rooks are now in our tote bag. They have both been sacrificed. It is a double exchange sacrifice. So the pawn takes, and then Shirov immediately goes after those double Isolanis. White plays a good move, king f2. And now bishop to e5 with some ideas in mind. Now, when I first played through this game many years ago when Fun Master Mike was a little guy, I thought queen c6 was a good move to threaten queen take c7 and get going on the battery. It turns out if queen c6, black can actually play something very similar to what happens in the game. Black would play the unbelievable oh. bishop takes g3, sacrificing another piece. Put that in the tote bag. And after king takes, oh. queen takes, the king only has one move. And you can actually take this rook because amazingly, if the king takes, you take oh. this pawn and all of these pawns, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five pawns for the rook and the weakened king. Black is at least equal. White has to play perfectly just to survive. And I like those odds. So let's go back after bishop to e5. White decides to play the move rook to h1, getting some counterplay on the h file. And you know what? Shirov plays bishop oh. takes g3 anyway. If you put that bishop out of your tote bag, you gotta put it back in the sacrifice tote bag because now we've sacrificed two rooks and a bishop. King takes, queen takes e3 check. Very similar position to the one we just looked at. Now you better not play king h2 because queen f2 check. And when your king takes, I mate you with a pawn. Look how pretty this is. It's often in chess we sacrifice our queen. I've got a whole series on that on chess kit. But how often do we sacrifice two rooks and two bishops? Um, how about never? I'll take uh, never for 100, please, Alex. Oh, we're not playing Jeopardy, we're playing chess. Okay, let's go back. So after queen takes e3, king can't go to h2. Instead, queen f3, but then the very calm queen takes rook. And the funny thing is, even though it looks like our bishop is in danger, you can't capture with your king because I fork your king and your queen. And if you capture with your rook, then I can fork your queen and your rook. And although you technically can save your rook with a check, when my king moves and your rook moves to h2, black gets all kinds of fun stuff after queen check. Because if you go back 
I take your pawn and I have a million pawns for the rook. Black is better. And if you play king h4, I can actually force a very similar thing. I can play check. And when you go back, I can check you again. And then when you go back, I can take oh. your pawn and you get the point. This position is winning for black. All of these pawns and the fact that white cannot go after the black king means that black should be winning. Okay, so let's go back to this position. We've already seen that white cannot take this bishop with either piece. So white gave a check. The king calmly moved forward. Then the king finally takes the bishop, but our tote bag is complete. We've sacrificed both rooks, both bishops. Uh, can't give away your queen. We do need her, but that is an amazing amount of material to give away and still be winning, especially because the next move is the very calm queen takes pawn. And we've looked at various versions of this so far today, a queen and a million pawns defeating a rook, but the black king is totally safe and the pawns are gonna march their way down the board. If you play a move like queen g2 to try to trade pieces like an old man, then I'm gonna play g4 check. And when your king moves backward to guard your queen, I'm gonna play this check. You can't block with your queen because then I'll truly win a million pawns, right? I'll keep taking more stuff. But if you play king g1, there's many different things that black could play. One is the very calm king g6 and look at this. White's pieces are so passive that Black will just slowly march his own pieces up the chessboard. So let's go back. The Queen did not come to G2. Instead, she stopped on D5. And there's a couple different winning moves. One is the quiet move, Queen F2. And good luck stopping Pawn G4 because uh, I don't think you can do it. You have to give away a lot of material. But instead, equally winning, although taking a little bit longer, was King to G6. And after Queen to D4, F4, and when the rook moves to g1, simply f5, and now g4 is officially coming, and there you have it. What a great final position where these pawns finally swarm the white king like a swarm of bees. What did we learn today? Well, when you let the dishes pile up, it gets hard to make them clean. But you might just become a chess kid hero if you can ever sacrifice like Alexei Shirov.